Yes, thank you for the introduction. Um, the paper is uh, Latent Barriers in Wiki-Based Collaborative Writing and it's a uh, result of a joint work. Um, this is the agenda. Uh, for me, it's the uh, introduction and the sociological analysis. All the other things will explain Alexander. What is the background of our work? It's uh, the idea of collaborative working, uh, writing, collaborative working. Many wikis follow Wikipedia and the success of Wikipedia has become a model for most of the other wikis. <coughs> wikis are a tool for equalization in collaborative uh, processes. What was promised uh, from collaborative uh, writing, I can say, there was a low threshold participation, the overcome of barriers of participation, but today we know about the unequal distribution of participation mm -hmm. in all internet media. Some say there is a 99, 1% uh, pattern or with regard to the underlying positional structure we um, did research in mailing lists, in online chats and in the German Wikipedia and we found in all these cases center periphery structures. The background ideas we refer to uh, four ideas. The first is the co-authorship, the second the overlapping time window based analysis, the sociological concept of positions and the center periphery structure. What's about co-authorship? <coughs> we know the collaboration is just different persons work together on articles and what's the standard measurement uh, mostly in computer science is just who works with whom together on an article. But the problem is, we know Wikipedia is now 11 years old and editing together in a time range of 10 or 11 years, can we count this as collaboration? Not exactly in the sense uh, in a, in a sociological sense, maybe in a formal sense, yes, but in a sociological sense I would say no. And which concept do we have for collaboration? Minimal, we can say they have to refer meaningful to each other, sinhaft in German, in Max Weber German, uh, uh, sinhafter Bezug refer meaningful to each other. The second is the overlapping time window based analysis. We have a problem in the standard measurement of compression. Um, the standard measurement of collaboration does not regard to the problem of compression and this leads to a distortion of the relational structure and we know um, work on articles is, ne is not necessarily continuous. A life circle of collaboration, we find this, phases of strong collaboration follow on periods in which a text is ready. <coughs> and with the concept of the overlapping time-based analysis we uh, refer to the limitation of participants memory. Um, we know everything is documented in uh, wikis and in Wikipedia so can say there is a textual memory but participants still refer to their experience of the behavior of others they will forget details of positions of persons of the other participants over time and the time window approach deals with the possibility of the limitation of 
the memory of the participants. The third concept, background concept, is that of uh, positions. Um, it's a postulate to say uh, the social world is arranged by positions. They are necessary for a reduction of complexity. They are negotiated in situations and this negotiation has to deal with different components like biographical content, like uh, experience with others in previous situations, with um, common sense knowledge or cultural tools or um, the theme ideology versus routines. The result of these nego negotiations are open, and it is open, but personal views can become stereotypes, stereotypes can become tools in situations where positions are negotiated. This process leads to a tendency towards a solidification of positions. But uh, it's open in general, but also we find this uh, uh, solidification. The fourth background concept is um, the idea of uh, center periphery and how to measure that. Um, we found, as I said that before, center periphery structures in different internet-based media. And the idea is we have two positions. We have a center and we have the uh, position in the periphery. There are different ideas uh, from, um, for this center periphery. Uh, this is an idea derived from block model analysis in the network research. <coughs> it's, this uh, is just an idea from uh, clustering of positions. We have a center with a high density of collaboration, and we have a periphery with only, um, they collaborate only with the center and have no collaboration with, with each other in the periphery. Or, um, this is a formal interpretation of different densities in the communication. It's from uh, my study of um, the German Wikipedia, we say there are, uh, there is a center, mostly admins, um, they are in contact with each, with each other, they uh, have meetings together, they have discussion fora, and the huge number of participants um, can't be there, have no contacts, have no meeting, have no conversation between each other. So, I will give the micro to... Thank you very much. I will now uh, explain a little bit about the experiment that we have done in order to shed light on this sociological analysis. And this uh, experiment starts from a description and comparison between two wikis. The one is a special purpose wiki and the other one is the Wikipedia itself. The special purpose wiki that we have analyzed and put forward in this talk today is the Gutenplug wiki. And if you are from Germany, of course, you know it. If you are not from Germany, I need to explain something. This has been our former Minister of Defense in Germany and he needs to dismiss his uh, job because people have shown by means of the Gutenplug wiki and other resources that his PhD actually was a plagiarism. What you see here is the linear order of the pages of his PhD. Uh, black and red are those for which at least one copy could be identified. At that time, there was much discussion in Germany in the public, so there was a really big run onto that wiki. Very many people started working on it, so there was much collaboration that tried to show that this actually is true with this plagiarism. What those people have done was, for example, that they have built that's pictures like this one, where you have a distribution of the sources from which this person has copies. So there's 
one source out of which the majority of cookies stem, where you have a huge set of uh, sources from which not so much has been copied. Of course, there has been much labor to produce pictures like this one. And the question now is how did those wiki locators, those persons, bring about this special purpose wiki? This is what we want to answer now, and to do that we might go back to classical collaboration analysis. That is, we have a collaboration network of persons, and if we now have two persons, say yellow and red, and if you have at least one document of which you can say that both are authors of, then you spend such a collaboration link between those two persons. Of course, this model is too simplistic, so it needs to be extended, and this is what we have done. Uh, this we do by means of postulates of the following sort. First we, start from, first we start from productivity, here by saying the higher the proportion of author A at text X, the higher his degree of authorship at this text. We then bring that, that in conjunction with a co-authorship by saying uh, the higher the authorship minimum of two authors, the higher the degree of co-authorship. Of course, what we do is that we do not count authorship below the level of words. That is, we start from the level of tokens. We make this kind of linguistic analysis. And even more, we do not count those authorships that are below the level of three words being inserted. Then the next step is what Christian already has explained with relation to the social, sociological concept of roles. And here we have nicely shown in the past that we could explain a little bit at least the deviation of the power law being fitted to the degree distribution of collaboration networks um, by means of showing that those different persons who have worked on this Wikipedia, the German one, belong to those different roles. So if we fit those degree distributions according to the membership of those roles, technical ones and more social ones, then we can better explain a better fit the power law behavior. The third point, and this already has also been mentioned by Christian, is time sensitivity. Here we say the closer the time of the contributions of two authors, the higher their degree of co-authorship. Think of two persons who are working at the same document. The one is doing it in one point of time, the other one in the other point of time. But when the other po a person starts working at the same document, the first person is already dead. In this case, you would hardly say that they uh, are co-authors or collaborators. Then, of course, we might also talk about more linguistic features, more linguistic postulates of collaboration, like cohesion and coherence. But to date, this is rather very hard, because for that you need a very profound means of computational linguistics to do that automatically. This is, of course, somehow uh, what we can do already, but uh, it's rather very effortful, so we did not do that today. Um, then. Finally, you need to put together your measurements according to those different postulates in two single statements. And basically, we say they tell you that if you find the more documents for which the degree of co-authorship is the higher, then you get more evidence in terms of the collaboration of these two authors. In our talk today, we concentrate on these two postulates, productivity. This has already been explained, and time sensitivity will now be explained. We start from a timeline, like that one, and onto that timeline we map then the collaboration networks. We do that by windows in the usual way, that have a certain width and a certain clock speed by which they are shifted step by step, and then we get a time series of those windows with according collaboration networks. This only collaboration that occurs in such a window is used to induce such a network. Next, we can then use those networks to induce time series of graph invariants that describe topological characteristics of these collaboration networks. This is what we have done by means of the Gutenberg wiki, and what you see here is short um, a picture of the order of those networks, that is the number of collaborators. We start at this time point of the settlement of the Gutenberg wiki. There are many, many people online in such a window of uh, three days, shifted one day by day. 
Then we go to the next point and you see how gradually less and less people collaborate till we finally get the last snapshot in which only two persons collaborated. These are these two persons. Well, here you see a picture that brings together uh, the numbers of collaborators in the Gutenberg window in a time window of length 30 days in the Gutenberg uh, wiki compared to the Wikipedia based on an extract starting from the seed article Berlin. You can nicely see that we have many, many people collaborating in this special wiki and then we can compare that with the high numbers of collaborators in the Wikipedia starting from that seed article. <coughs> so how do we characterize now those networks? We do that by complex network analysis using rather simplistic indices. We start with the watson strogels cluster coefficient. This is a collaborator who has two other collaborators, B and C. Then we ask for the probability which they collaborate on their own. We just count the number of edges ending at neighbors of this vertex here and relate this to the number of all possible pairs of neighbors of that vertex here. This is an unweighted average cluster value. It is unweighted clustering. And this compared to the next one that is weighted, and it weights clustering the impact of a vertex by the number of its links. By here, in our case, this means by the number of its collaborations. So the more collaborations the vertex has, the higher its impact on counting for clustering. That's what at least by using our approach, then this gives us access to the dynamics of these two cluster coefficients. Let us look at results. So every of those different vertices here now represents a, a separate point in time of a separate collaboration window on the Gutenberg wiki. We start with a window of a length two being shifted day by day and you see we have a rather stable behavior. Uh, blue is CWS, it is a weighted, uh, sorry, it's unweighted and green is weighted clustering. You see we have a rather stable behavior at the beginning. Then the question is what happens if we now extend the size of this window step by step to three days, to 10 days, make a jump, to 20 days, then to 30 days. And now we see how here emerges a pattern. We see na namely now that there is divergence between the unweighted variant of the clustering and the weighted one. Weighted one means that these are the vertices that have many collaborations. They have a high impact with their clustering. So here the clustering depends on those vertices that are very collaborative. They work together while there is a huge periphery of lurkers or followers, so, so to speak, that do not work together among each other. Interestingly, this is more or less the data of the demission of the minister. <coughs> Okay, there's the divergence of those two cluster values and this is an indicator of the dynamics of the center periphery structure, at least an indicator. I will say a little bit more about that later on. Then we go to the Wikipedia to look what happens there. How do we do that? We can't compare the complete Wikipedia to the Gutenberg Wiki. I mean, we have here millions of articles. How to do that? It's too heterogeneous. So we need to concentrate. We take a seed article. Say, for example, Barack Obama. And then we uh, start from the network of all those articles that are exactly one link separated by this article and get the network structure by the interlinks of those vertices. We do that not by Barack Obama but by Berlin and doing so for the two-day window we get that picture and for comparison reasons you see here over or there you see the Gutenberg uh, wiki values. You see for example that now the weighted cluster coefficient is about the unweighted one although we have the reversal case here. Then we enlarge the size of the window step by step, come to 10 days and we see how also here we have the emergence of a certain structure but looks much more different than in this case. So, uh, rather we have here a point, an equal point um, of starting where those two different cluster values start from to evolve differently. And here we have a transition between two different system states. <coughs> Well, of course, we did not only analyze the Gutenberg Wiki, but many more of them, uh, namely from the area of leisure communication, of regional communication, scientific communication, and technical communication. I will not go into the details of that, but let me just point out the fact that time sensitivity is very important. If, for example, you look for the collaboration 
uh, network in an un time unsensitive manner, then you get unrealistically low levels of the exponent of the power law being fitted to the corresponding degree distribution. Well, if you do the very same for the collaboration windows that have been computed for 30-day windows, then also we retain to a very high degree the power law scale-free behavior, but we get much more realistic power law values, power law exponent values. The same is true for clustering. We see get, that we get unrealistically high values of clustering in the uh, time insensitive manner, while they get more realistic, that means here lower in this case, in the case of time sensitive modeling. So now come to a discussion of our results. First of all, to bring that back to the part of uh, Christian, who has explained that uh, there's one notion of um, uh, center periphery that starts from a center of persons who work together and have many, many links and periphery that only of vertices that only collaborate with members of the kernel. We can relate that a little bit at least as an indicator to this part of the curve because here the highly um, active persons are interlinked. They, uh, so to speak, build here their cluster values while those uh, persons that are, have not many, many outgoing links do not really cluster among each other. The reversal case is true in the case of Wikipedia because we have this uh, deviation from the uh, unweighted cluster coefficient to the weighted, weighted um, the counterpart. Of course, starting from this example, it's only an example so far, we then can think of a typology and here we just distinguish the different uh, phase transitions starting from these time series and looking at these two coefficients from the weighted cluster coefficient and the unweighted one, then we can just count account for the different variants. Here, for example, we have um, a an, an, an high level of entropy. Both states go together uh, from two different uh, starting points, or the, in the reversal case, they fork uh, into different directions, also starting or ending up in different uh, states of the system. Looking back at Wikipedia, by example of Berlin, and this special purpose wiki, they can then be settled into these cells of this typology. I now come to an end of our talk um, and give a short conclusion. First of all, we have argued for time that matters in collaboration analysis. At least you can see how much diversity there is if you look for different windows, of course, so this can't be otherwise expected. However, it should also be shown and of course you can also learn a lot about the time dependency of the collaborators if you look for this parameter in your model. Then we also have talked about types of the dynamics of networking. We would like to further elaborate this, uh, type, uh, this typology and at least we think that we have explained a little bit of starting point for that model. We have done that so far by means of easily computable cluster values that serve here as indicators of center periphery. Of course, that they are easily computable also has its price, namely that these are only, so, uh, that they are not sufficient, but only necessary conditions. We cannot know directly by them that there is a classical center periphery structure. Last but not least, in future work, we want to work with more wikis, of course, also with, with more indicators of collaborations and of course also with better segmentations, especially of the Wikipedia that departs from the model that we have proposed today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions, so um, And yeah, as one of the objects of investigation here, um, I take a little bit of asking the definition of co-authorship mm -hmm. um, because co-authorship was not just writing words in the wiki in this particular Wikipedia wiki version and I don't think it's the same thing in the Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia is actually different in the sense that there were a lot of other offline activities and a lot of collaboration on the chat that would would be a co-authorship in my uh, yeah. My feelings, mm. I think, but would not be reflected in your model here. A very good point. Um, I, I don't know. Sorry, it's still my. <laughs> a very good point, and also a starting point of considering our model. Mm. Um, 
please have in mind what I have said when I have enumerated all those postulates. They came from very simplistic measurements, mm -hmm. count the number of words a person has written, and they, they turned out with something saying about cohesion and even more important, coherence. Mm -hmm. We know from a dialogue, for example, that it's turn-taking. And if you take a turn to what I have said, of course, you, you relate your words to what I have said. There are not metaphorical expressions, of, for example, ellipses, and so on, many, many linguistic relations there. This is what we want to do, mm -hmm. yeah, this, so to speak, our, our telos, so that is certainly future work, but we start with a rather simplistic model in order to make that countable. Uh, but in yeah. any sense, uh, yeah, it's absolutely right. I do that, for example, in terms of dialogue model. They are already considered mm -hmm. something like that. Um, can you say it's very difficult to measure um, that like you mentioned about how, how can we say they are uh, <coughs> refer, refer meaningfully to each other uh, we just see there is something uh, reverted <coughs> from the version before mm -hmm. on, on that uh, level we, we can't say anything about mm -hmm. that we, we have uh, to introduce uh, something like uh, a model which has to do uh, a bit with the reality <laughs> more mm -hmm. than, than yeah. uh, I think the standard. We need to do st uh, things step by step. The point, of course, you can say, for example, something about lexical cohesion. This is very good automatized already. Yeah? So if you, for example, have two sentences, one being written by person A, the other one being written by person B, and we can say whether we find lexical constituents in the second sentence that are related to constituents of the first one. If this is the case, that at least is a hint that there is, uh, so to speak, a reflection by the second person of what the first person has written. So this would also be a small step in the ladder of making the model more realistic. But this, of course, needs to be done step by step. So I actually have the same problem about this word collaboration. So I'm wondering if it might be helpful just to change the word and to talk about participation. So collaboration, at least I would say, implies that people really want to so plan to work together. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it in, in the written lab wiki. It might be, but in Wikipedia I don't know. So sometimes. But, um, so if you talk about participation, so patterns of participation in different regions, this might be a solution to, to avoid this kind of mm. Well, the point is that you have to see that we want to come out with such a linguistic analysis. It's really, so to speak, mm -hmm. our aim to do that. I mean, we <coughs> understand collaboration measurement as something for which you get idly more and mm. more evidence. Yeah? I, I would really say that it is, should and would be possible to transform a model from linguistics, from discourse analysis, to writing in Wikipedia. I'm sure that we need to distinguish many of our terms that have been developed in the past because this is a new document type. We want to do that. And, and to be honest, of course, if you start with something that is more simplistic, then you have to say that. But of course, you should not uh, miss to say that your target is to come out with a more linguistically profound model. That's the one point. The other point is uh, rather very simplistic that uh, the community speaks in this case of collaboration. I mean, collaboration analysis in the past has been very simplistic. Look for, at models from 2006, for example. They even do not look at the amount of persons that they, uh, the amount of data persons have uh, submitted to uh, to a different article. So. <laughs> So uh, my idea is um, to look more at the uh, different positions and maybe the article is not the only level for this analysis. Then when we have a look into the article and the collaboration, we can um, see that there are different positions. For instance, um, Van is uh, it works in another way um, with the text, with the reversion of the, of the text, then uh, can you also um, uh, know something about the, the topic of the article. And uh, 
they all the different positions work together to collaborate to uh, but, but then then I'm, I'm sorry but then I'm wondering if the talk page might be more interesting for you so if you end up talk page uh, looking at uh, the discussions people have and then inviting the change I don't know if this is possible but you know like yeah. they discuss a certain aspect of the mm -hmm. article and then might the change. change and yeah. then the yeah. final decision yeah. or the outcome of this yeah. I mean, if you are interested in finding something that is very like to oral communication, of course, that would be a good advice. Yeah. But if you, from the beginning, understand Wikipedia as a new sort of document where you find new laws of collaborative writing and you want to deal with that exactly, then mm -hmm. it's not such a good advice yeah. because you want them to deal with the complete data. And it would even say that it's more difficult to do that for article networks, but nevertheless, to have this idea in mind, to have this hypothesis that there is a sort of collaborative writing for which we get a research topic and ask for the laws that are behind those patterns that we found there. At least we find some pattern. Uh, we did this for a small amount of articles uh, in German Wikipedia and in many of these cases discussion has nothing to do with the article. We don't have much time left, but maybe if you keep the question and we keep the answer short, we can cover it on more questions. Very short, the question. Uh, I mean, you, you showed us two models um, that you identified in the, in the, in the different mm -hmm. types of people. Have you any idea um, about what factors are, um, um, are the reasons for development in one or the other model, either network factors or substantive? I think this relates somehow to the specifics of the Gutenberg wiki. Actually, it turns out that during the work on that wiki, it was not so much about collaboration. It was rather work of a very small group who worked very concentratedly and did the job. It was not the community. It was a small group, and that's the reason for that. Okay, so again. Uh, sorry to intervene before you go on to the next talk. I don't want to be divisive, <laughs> but um, you, you know, um, the second parallel session is now about to start. Because we had our first talk was canceled, and so there, there, that's why this huge crowd is in this room. And I want to take all those interested in the other two talks that are taking place to follow me to the next room. That's not fair. I'm sorry, but that's good. thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for staying. <laughs> Um, my name is Eileen Oeberst, I'm from the Knowledge Media Research Center in uh, Tübingen and um, my colleagues and I are highly interested in collaborative uh, knowledge construction and especially under um, highly uncertain circumstances and this is why we um, chose to observe and kind of analyze the article of uh, Fukushima and I would like to share some of the results um, of that study. Um, today with you. But uh, first a little bit background. Uh, when we talk about collaborative knowledge construction, first of all, what is knowledge? Uh, this is, of course, a very, very old answer. And there's been philosophers since thousands of years addressing that question. And maybe one can kind of come to the minimal consensus of philosophy regarding knowledge as something like justified true belief. So we find a lot of accounts, but this is like the minimum consensus we find there. And in psychology, it's um, actually a remarkably difficult task to um, search for a definition because they actually kind of circumvent some kind of conception and they rather deal with a more generic term of information and maybe information that is stored in memory or whatever. But what they all have in common uh, mostly is that they deal with individuals. So basically 2,000 years of philosophy have always placed knowledge in minds or in individual heads and also psychology is mainly focused on individuals but we find at least something like situated, distributed and shared cognition concept like that which kind of transcend the, the individual. But um, of course with these models in mind and of course there are other disciplines that have um, worked on that as well but it just um, kind of um, limited my talk on that. Um, we have a problem when it comes to collaboration because actually that's nothing that can be explained by traditional epistemology, epistemology for instance. 
also we cannot, as Popper already pointed out, um, explain growth in knowledge, in world knowledge, um, as we find both in Wikipedia. And um, so we kind of um, start from another account, which is basically a system theoretical account, which has the basic assumption that there is no universal de definition of knowledge, and there can never be. But instead, um, it kind of assumes that every knowledge system has its own system-specific definition, and so, of course, we can um, assume that a knowledge system, something like Wikipedia, has a different definition or um, code or whatever um, than, for instance, the scientific system, which, of course, is a, um, a knowledge system as well. So if the code is the, the, the most important or the crucial element, um, then, of course, it is interesting or rather important to look at it. And for Wikipedia, I guess you are all very, very familiar with uh, Wikipedia's code in a system theoretical account or with its principles, with the pillars, etc. And of course there, there's a lot more, but I just want to focus in my talk on two um, main points of it, and this is verifiability and the neutral point of view, because I'm going to present data on that. Of course there's more than this. Um, but if this is uh, something like the, the crucial element that defines a worthy or a valuable contribution um, to the Wikipedia, then um, this is what we want to look at. Um, so, now that we have knowledge, how it is constructed. And uh, usually if we talk about encyclopedias, um, then we rather deal with knowledge that has been recognized in at least some way in the world before. Um, thus leaving the very process of knowledge construction rather in the dark. And this is what we were mainly interested in. And that is why we also chose the Wikipedia, because of course it stands out due to its um, responsiveness. I mean, if there's anything relevant in the world happening, of course it, get, it gets introduced into the Wikipedia quite fast. And so you can not only observe the very result of the process of knowledge construction, like in Britannica, then a year later or whatever, but instead you can observe the very process of knowledge construction. And this is what we did. And um, this is why we chose the, the um, incident or the nuclear catastrophe of um, Fukushima because um, actually nobody in the very beginning knew at all what was going on there, what exactly happened, what, what, um, what, um, um, what kind of, uh, what, what, uh, what extent uh, the des disaster took. And so um, this is why we, now let me get to the study, why we chose um, the German article on the nuclear power plant. This is no mistake, but instead um, it was already there before the nuclear disaster unfolded and um, most of the activity uh, took place here and then later after exactly on March 19th it migra migrated to the nuclear catastrophe article and we kind of took this as, as a natural um, barrier and um, um, analyze this time frame because we, as I said, were mostly interested in this, this very beginning where the information was totally uncertain. And so, yeah, we analyzed that one and we also took a look into the related talk page, uh, which had, I think, about, yes, 122 pages at the time of the migration of the article. And um, another argument for analyzing uh, the article was uh, because of its the, the tremendous attention it received at the time. So um, I'm guess, I guess you're familiar with the traffic statistics. Um, only for March uh, 2011, we find more than 700,000 views on that page. So it had been heavily used for informing, for um, seeing what was going on. And the lion's share of the visits fall in, uh, within this, um, falls within the time frame of our analysis. So um, it was really heavily perceived and receptive. Um, so let me get to the results. Oh, I'm sorry, I think there's some, some slide missing. Oh, no. Um, so the results I have structured somehow in the way that I first gonna present some general findings. Do you want me to? No. Sorry, I thought you said something about the microphone. <laughs> um, then about the compliance to Wikipedia's code. And then um, I'm going to present an expert evaluation we conducted in the very end to see, uh, uh, to learn more about the art uh, article quality. So let me start with the general findings. Okay, um, I guess you all know the history flow diagrams, um, a tool 
um, we used just to visualize a little bit uh, what was going on in the very beginning. So let me just summarize. The article was started in June 2007 and there was until the very beginning of the, the until the very first edit that we, we regarded the nuclear disaster, there was something like 40 or 50 edits, not, not very much. And um, the last edit has been something like a year before the catastrophe started and the first edit was done. And then here we, we see very well that how um, something happens, how um, new information gets introduced, but this is only like the first 100 edits. So if we take a look at the whole, um, the whole time frame we analyzed, so this is only till March 19th, um, then we see the tremendous growth in information and we also see, uh, I guess you're familiar with it, different colors reflect different authors. So we see very nicely um, the different contributing authors and that every vertical line is like an, a version of the article. So if we take the last version, which was the one before it migrated, um, then we see at the line that there is a lot of different colors. So actually it was, of course, no surprise. A uh, product of collaborative writing and knowledge construction. So just to summarize a little bit in some facts, we had 308 contributing au um, authors. It was in the time frame, I always have to um, kind of emphasize that, it was 1,159 edits, so about every 10 minutes an edit, and the maximum pause I think was something like five hours, even in the nights. And uh, there was a total of 66 something bytes added. And in the final version, before the migration of the article, um, it contained 109 references, um, nine external links and six internal links. Um, so what about the very process? Um, as I said, um, from a system theoretical account, the code of a knowledge system is the, is the very crucial element. So um, the code of Wikipedia, or part of the code, being verifiability and neutral point of view, we wanted to see how about compliance in this, in this case. And um, I don't know if it's too small, I hope not. So for verifiability, we first analyzed like those cases in which new information was introduced, how many cases also it was backed up by a reference. So uh, meaning that Introducing a reference makes an information verifiable, of course. So, of the more than 1,000 edits, there were 213 edits in which new content was introduced. And um, in 186 cases, sorry, 68 cases, um, it was accompanied immediately by a reference. In 45 cases, it was not. But, actually, if you look much deeper into it, the reference was not added in 17 cases because it was already existent, so it was just maybe an update from this <coughs> very same, uh, same source because, of course, there have been live tickers, news tickers, etc. on that um, topic, and so the source was the same. It also referred to it, um, just the content was updated. And in another nine cases, it was um, the case that another, usually another, user added a reference to the previously unreferenced content. Um, in six cases the information was deleted and so there were only like 13 information or contents added um, in which, uh, which remained unreferenced and if we take these together we have like 194 contents that were eventually referenced, which is, I think, a really pretty high number compared to begin with. Um, so um, the conclusion would be something like, um, we find a high rate of compliance in the first place. A lot of references have been um, inserted at the very time when, when um, the information was introduced, um, but also some cases of distributed accomplishment when another um, user added a lacking reference. And we also, of course, no surprise, find an intense and lively debate on the talk page and mostly around something like source credibility, of course, which information or which sources of like media um, are more credible than others, or something like 
is it useful to refer to the primary source like um, the, the homepage of the operating company TEPCO or um, rather not because they might have a conflict of interest and stuff like that. And um, this was um, a very interesting point I found. Um, we had um, we observed a discussion around something like verifiable speculations. What I want to say with that is um, that of course there were lots of kind of experts in the media which um, like stated something and of course if you have the reference to that interview or whatever to that stream uh, you, you have a reference you can verify it so it's an information that uh, complies to the demand of ver verifiability but it may nevertheless be a speculation which you do not want to have in there so there has been a lively debate about this one and you, sh you could op of course have an, uh, a lone talk on this one but I just want to leave it that way um, but what about other facets of the code? Like if we take a neutral point of view, we also find a very high rate of compliance. Actually, there have been only four instances that disrespected um, this demand, and it was mostly biased phrasing or personal evaluations. And uh, have in mind that it was something like 1,159 ed edits overall. And they all, those four, have been deleted within two to 11 minutes. So but now that we have seen um, that they comply to the code, compliance is nice, but what does it result in? That was the question we had uh, in mind when we conducted an expert evaluation where we asked leading scientists from, the, um, from a non-profit, or we selected them from a non-profit um, organization on um, reactor safety and they were all leading scientists in the fields of nuclear energy, nuclear power. And uh, we gave them the version of the article of the, uh, the time frame we analyzed. So it was the version of the 19th of March and um, before the migration. And uh, we asked them to evaluate the version and with respect to quality, accuracy, errors, etc. And um, the main results, I'm going to just focus on a little bit of it. Um, is that they all those six experts that agreed uh, gave a five or a three um, uh, sorry a five or a six so they all agreed on a quite high um, quality with respect to accuracy um, interestingly um, even though it's only a five or a six um, only one expert mentioned um, errors when we asked for them and the others did not and there were even experts which I found quite interesting who said um, Actually, I can only rate this part of the article because actually I have not really much um, knowledge about the rest of it. Uh, which really brings us back to the issue of expertise. Um, and um, this is another uh, very interesting part. So we got back to the one who mentioned errors and we conducted an additional telephone interview to learn more about it. And um, he said that, um, well, he identified mainly two major errors. And it is noteworthy that these errors had been in the media and the information within the article had been referenced and by now they had been taken out. Um, and he only mentioned some minor errors, but he clearly stated that um, the quality of the article was way above the average of the media, results, uh, media reports that were available at that time, which was a clear statement. And others um, who we did not interview, but um, um, he said in the survey, um, um, confirmed this as well. Um, regarding the neutral point of view, they all um, said that it was very well written in a very neutral and uh, balanced manner and you also find on the talk page congratulations regarding the, the, the presentation, the form of presentation regarding its neutrality. And um, so let me sum this up and then I get to the final end, to the end, to the final, whatever. Um, we find a quite high accuracy and an unbiased uh, presentation. This is, I think, even more impressive in consideration of the fact that the informa uh, information available was really highly uncertain at that time. Second, the topic is quite specific. I mean, you need some kind of expertise on that, or you need at least to have uh, access to research um, to inform yourself. And on the other hand, of course, uh, such incidents are highly emotionally and ideologically charged. So I think it's really impressive with that regard um, what happened here, what we observed here. But um, so we can say Wikipedia's code was really highly effective in this case. But I would really like to stress 
that the validity of this conclusion is just limited to this case. So to the selected article, we observed only this one, only the German version, so don't, please don't name me with some kind of generalization that I do not want to make, okay? So, and also, of course, with uh, respect to the analyzed time frame. Although I noted that it is nominated for the Ziegler Prize, so it must have been beyond this time frame um, uh, a result that was observed there as well, so quite high quality. So, yeah, thanks. That was it. Thank you. Questions? Yes, I can you go back to your summary slide? Uh, first of all, ah, okay, one more. I wanted to ask the, the, the interview with the, uh, with, the, um, with the experts. Sorry. Okay. So, the interview with the experts, um, it was related to the whole article, right? To the what? To the whole article. Um, yes, to the whole article, but in its 19th March version. Yeah. yeah so with the section, new section. On, was it just the one section or was the information on, on the... It was the whole article. Yeah, the whole. was the information about the incident, was it all uh, in one section or was it spread over the whole article? Um, well, no, there was some, um, as I remember com correctly, there was first some background information on the technical sites and uh, information details. And <coughs> then it was more or less restructured throughout the process of editing, but um, I think um, after the background information it was more or less um, and a little bit on, on, on previous like uh, f failed, um, failed, failed, I'm missing the word, um, there were some scandals in the past that, ha that had been okay. before, anyways, um, I don't know the correct word in English, sorry, um, and afterwards um, the, the rest of the article was only devoted to um, what was going on after the, after incident. the okay. incident, yes. Oh, okay. so is, is there some, some reason for asking? Because I no, it's just, uh, I was just wondering what, what, uh, what the, the quality uh, assessment of the experts actually mm -hmm. refers to. Mm -hmm. Because if I have an article that is 500 pages long and I have a, uh, a subsection that deals with the, mm -hmm. with the incidents, then it does not say a lot about mm -hmm. information for the incident. Mm -hmm. No, but it was actually like something like 18 pages and I think the background was less than one page. Okay, so it was so really that's large. interesting yeah. because then it does something about the actual added information in yeah. this part. Then it's okay. Um, and can you go to the summary? That is this, the, uh, this the next? Yeah, we already have this here. Mm -hmm. So, um, why would you say, I, would not, I don't understand why the information available is highly uncertain, does actually matter here, because people just, as I see it, they just cite what they see in the media. They, I mean, why would it actually matter if the information was highly uncertain? <laughs> um, Actually, I would uh, not agree with that. Um, um, of course, this is one, one, can, um, one possibility of the article being correct could be that the media was correct. And um, this would also be con uh, consistent with your idea that they just copy whatever is in the media. But this was ex exactly not the case. Um, we found a lot of um, arguments on the talk page on that. Um, for instance, there have been in the media lots of errors in... Um, physical units, something like microsievert or millisievert and stuff like that. And um, so this was, for instance, uh, one thing where you could exactly see in the, in the article that this error was not done. And it was, um, it was discussed on the talk page and stuff like that. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> this just being one, uh, one argument, um, I think, um, I, I did not say a lot about the talk page, uh, but I think the discussions there really show that it was not just simple copying, but rather um, really trying to make sense of, of, of the really flooding information that was, flood of information that was incoming. Because I mean, you had really lots of uh, sources somehow, but, um, and they were kind of contradicting, they were inconsistent, so it was really not just simple copying of what was in there, but trying to... Yeah. Okay. We have also, um, there were also um, um, incidents uh, which I found quite interesting, uh, 
for, uh, for example, when uh, one picture was published and uh, then there was a discussion about an explosion and, and but nobody really knew what kind of explosion it was and then um, they were they were discussing on the talk page well actually um, the picture of the reactor shows that it's a reactor of type blah 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 and so uh, this must uh, lead us to um, to the content that um, it is built from this and this and so an explosion can never be something like this or whatever so they really try to make sense and um, also integrate background information and try to um, yeah come to um, uh, in order to s kind of evaluate um, the information that was spread through the media so I would not agree with it's only in the media and just uh, translate it into yeah, that was my question yeah, actually, okay. I wanted to know which part of the media yeah. Yeah. information is actually transferred how it's curated and how it's filtered yeah okay. you're actually saying it's that's a process that works very well. Okay. Also, maybe another point. Um, um, there was a, a heavy debate on um, yeah, um, citing, for instance, uh, BBC or um, RD or whatever, um, because actually they all said, um, well, all information comes from the very, um, the very primary source, which is always like the operating company. I mean, they like um, information about um, the dose rate and stuff like that. Uh, BBC does not have any other form of me measurement, so they all have to relate to the primary source. So why not cite? The primary source, something like this. So uh, it was not just really simple reliance on, on that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> One more question again, I have to ask if you keep the question. Oh, sorry, yes, I will. Very nice talk, very long dialogue after the talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have a short question. Um, as far as I understood you, you apply a sort of content model onto the contents of this article. And my question is, how do we identify the constituents of this content? Do we do that intellectually, by annotation, or do we do that automatically? <laughs> um, good question. We tried uh, different methods, and um, first uh, we uh, we first had uh, the method of uh, selecting only those edits which add more than at least 150 bytes, because this is a something like a sentence, so you could extract like, um, or the idea was to extract those um, edits in which at least something like a sentence was added. Um, but actually it get lost, uh, uh, some, some uh, specific contents get lost because uh, it's below the threshold or because um, maybe they deleted something and then wrote something new which is in some not more than 150 bytes. So actually we, um, we then uh, got back and um, looked through the, uh, through the changes uh, manually to check whether um, our method was, was valid and then we identified those cases in which it was not. So actually I have no better solution, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Can I ask a quick question? But a really quick question. Yes. So, uh, how would you assess the compliance to NPOD? Um, well, um, there, of course, there's no criteria, but, um, but um, actually, we only um, looked at what deviates from the neutral point of view, which is something like biased phrasing or personal speculation, and uh, we just identified those uh, those cases in which uh, there was some disrespect, and it was not more than four cases in more than a thousand. So I would say you can argue for a high compliance rate um, um, regarding to that demand. There's no more I can add. Maybe that, maybe we can talk about that later, maybe. So the press one to your talk, yeah. that's also common, that's well. Yeah, maybe we can again, discuss about that later. Um, I'm Bernardo Esteves, here is Henrique Kuckerman. So we're both from the um, uh, Program of History of Science and Epistemology at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he is the supervisor of my PhD, uh, and these are very preliminary results, so of uh, what I expect to become a thesis in a lot of, I mean, until the end of next year at least. So, uh, and we're trying to assess the climate change controversy in Portuguese Wikipedia through 15 articles. So I guess you've, uh, you've all heard of that uh, controversy. So uh, temperatures are rising and uh, apparently uh, humans are to blame for that. We are, uh, the mainstream position is that we are uh, emitting lots of uh, greenhouse gases through the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, land use change, agriculture, industry, etc. This is the, the mainstream position backed by 97% uh, of scientists, of climate scientists publishing in that field 
according to a recent study published in PNAS. So uh, this is a very asymmetrical con controversy because I mean, only a, a small minority is, uh, is opposing that uh, mainstream position. And the, the mainstream position is backed uh, by the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, which is the United Nations uh, organ to deal with that issue. And the opposing view, the minority uh, position, stands that the rising temperatures are due to uh, an increase in the solar cycle uh, activity and other uh, natural factors. So, and we are, uh, we, we, we are approaching this uh, controversy with actor network theory, which is uh, um, a theory born within the social uh, studies of science, which is our original field, and uh, which I will call AMT from now on. Is there anyone familiar with AMT here? With her or never heard? Sorry? With her or never heard? No, is there anyone familiar with, with the, these terms? I, I will give a, a very short uh, uh, summary of, of what it says. So, uh, according to AMT, which uh, has been shown by Bruno Latour and other um, scientists, to, it, has been shown to, uh, it has been shown a very useful tool to assess science controversies. And, uh, a, a classical example of it is the controversy uh, that opposed Pasteur to Pouchet in the end of the 19th century, uh, and uh, which involved the spontaneous generation of life. And after the settling of that controversy, bacteria were admitted into existence in our world. So, and uh, often science controversies involve the 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 decision whether existence should be granted to a given entity, for instance, bacteria. So after the settling of that controversy, which was won by Pasteur, as everyone knows, bacteria were admitted to our world, and today we live in a world where bacteria are... the existence of bacteria is not denied by anyone else. Because, and a and T will explain the, 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 the force of these entities, of, of bacteria, because they, uh, uh, as, as we put here, uh, because the, the, its existence can be understood in terms of the strengthening of a uh, complex socio-technical network of elements supporting it. If you want to deny today the existence of bacteria, you have to, to dispute Nestlé, who produces yogurts, or you have to dispute the, the big pharma companies who produces antibiotics. So this, these are the kinds of... Uh, uh, different elements uh, that compose this social technical network who reinforces the existence of, uh, of such entities like bacteria. So uh, that's the way uh, uh, actor network theory uh, uh, explains the settling of, of science controversies. And uh, uh, so if we, uh, uh, since uh, AMT is a good uh, conceptual framework to assess science controversies. We thought that it might be a good tool as well to assess science controversies and other controversies in the social technical environment of Wikipedia. So just to go back to uh, um, the global warming controversy, what we have, we live in a world where, uh, we live in a world of human-made uh, uh, global warming because, uh, I mean, all countries, or 192 countries, are together in the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Panel on Climate Change. They have signed uh, a treaty which uh, admits that uh, human action is leading to global warming, and uh, several governments are involved in uh, different actions to try to reduce their greenhouse gases emissions and all. So, and this uh, gl uh, human-made global warming is strengthened by a uh, lot of different elements like uh, hockey stick graphs and uh, threatened polar bears and uh, uh, soybean fields and I mean a lot of human and non-human elements and this is a very important uh, uh, point in Latour's uh, view of, of science controversies. Just to give you a, a kind of example, so uh, 
these are all these examples. Uh, hockey stick graphs, polar bears, soybeans. These are all uh, uh, agents that contribute to actors who contribute to strengthen the position of, of global, human-made global warming. Just to give you a, a short example out again of, of global warming, think of the Loch Ness Monster. So uh, does the Loch Ness Monster exist? This is not a good question in terms of ANT. Because uh, for ANT, it will, con uh, will consider it as an, an actor because it makes people travel to Scotland. It makes people uh, write articles on it, write books and make documentaries and all. So whatever make people, make other actors act is considered an agent, an actor by ANT. So this is a, a very deep difference in assessing science controversies for Latour and ANT. Uh, Act, uh, agency is also granted to non-human actors. So this is the case here. We have a very uh, strong uh, social, techno, social technical network of actants uh, strengthening the, the case of uh, human-made global warming. So let's go to uh, and Ogor, of course. I forgot to mention him. He's also a human actor reinforcing the, the global warming, the human-made global warming. So let's take a look at uh, how it works with Wikipedia. So the first uh, very obvious uh, point that shows us that we can treat Wikipedia as a social technical environment is that we have bots. We have very clearly uh, non-human actors uh, negotiating along with human users the, the contents of articles that it has been shown by this paper we mentioned, but by several others that are mentioned in our paper as well. So we're not the first one to, to try to look at Wikipedia under the ANT light. So, uh, and uh, another very good uh, uh, point to, to show that Wikipedia can be uh, uh, analyzed by AMT is that the, the verifiability, so the fact that uh, statements should be uh, supported by uh, external references is, uh, uh, is a way to, to bring allies to support that point of view. So, uh, and the, the, the mobilization of allies is a very, uh, is a way to, to describe the strengthening of a, of a complex social technical network supporting a point of view. So the very, the, the very fact that people add a reference it helps strengthen that, that position, that statement in Wikipedia. So uh, I don't know if any of you were yesterday in the Srebrenica presentation, so in which the, the, the way the Srebrenica massacre or genocide was described in several Wikipedias. Uh, we, we tried to look at the, this art, the, the current version of this article, and in the, in the introduction of the English Wikipedia, it was said that Srebrenica's massacre, also known as Srebrenica's genocide, and then you had five or six different references. I mean, if you, need, if you want to dispute that point of view, you have to dispute the six references. I mean, it's, it's not the user who included that information. You have to dispute that user, you have to dispute the BBC, you have to dispute all the sources that that user has included to, su to support his statement. So it's a way to, to, to bring allies to a, a discussion. So it characterizes as well Wikipedia as a social, techni social technical system. And uh, Latour has said in a 1987 book that reality is what, is what resists and not what exists. And uh, in a similar way, we can conceive uh, the, the stabili stabilization of a Wikipedia article in terms of uh, the resistance of its statements to other Wikipedians' interventions. And uh, uh, our colleague in the first presentation mentioned earlier that um, everything is documented in wikis. And the very fact that uh, uh, all the associations made in, 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 a, uh, in a given article are traceable, are registered, is a, very, uh, is a, uh, is a fact that helps a lot to, to, to make visible these associations to uh, any AMT scholar. So it's, it, it helps a lot to treat Wikipedia in ANT terms. And uh, another fact, uh, Latour describes the uh, actors or actants 
in terms of what they do. People are not what they are, but they are what they do and what they make other people do and, and other people and other non-human actors as well. So, and this is exactly the way uh, actors are defined in Wikipedia because it, it doesn't count who you are. What counts in Wikipedia is what you do in the project. So it's a very uh, clear example of, I mean, the, the definition of actors and users are uh, very similar. So let's uh, finally go to our empirical analysis. This, these are uh, quick figures to, to give you a quick overview of Portuguese Wikipedia. And uh, here we have, uh, we can compare some patterns of edition of um, the global warming article in the 10 largest Wikipedias. As we can see uh, in the Portuguese Wikipedia, even though it is the 10th largest Wikipedia, it is the fifth with more edits in this article and it has a very high rate of edits per editor in this article. And uh, so we, we had a sample of 15 articles of global warming related articles that we selected to, uh, in which we, uh, we were likely to find the, the performance of this controversy. And uh, we started our study with uh, some, some quantitative uh, analysis to, to give you a, a quick overview. These are very preliminary data. We intend to, to work further on this statistical analysis. So this is just a, a starting point. And uh, we, we intend to do a more sophisticated work. But we can see some, some patterns. As we can see, the, the 15 articles in our sample was very unevenly, unevenly edited. We have three very uh, highly edited articles, global warming, uh, greenhouse uh, effect, and Kyoto protocol. And then we have a kind of a long tail until the, we, we reach the 15 articles. And we have found some unsurprising correlations between the number of edits and the number of editors. Uh, and also between the number of edits and the number of edits in the talk page of the articles as well as in the number of edits and the number of reverts, for instance. So here we have the yearly distribution of the edits in our 15 articles. As we can see, uh, the year of 2007 uh, had 30% of all edits in our sample, which is also uh, not very surprising because it was uh, a year uh, in which we had the fourth assessment report of the IPCC and we have a, a burst of media coverage of climate change all over the world and in Brazil as well. So uh, this explains this, this uneven distribution of edits throughout the years. And uh, so this, this analysis, this statistical analysis gives us an overview of, of what we had in, in those articles. But it's, it's just a, a, a powerful tool for generalizations. It doesn't give us a, 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 a clear view of what was happening inside the article, of what kinds of, of claims were made by, by users concerning the causes of climate change. So we looked through the, um, all edits in all articles of our samples and in their talk pages. And this is... Uh, what you see is the global warming article in the final time of our, um, of our sample, which is 10 March 2012, I guess. So you have this, uh, the exact date uh, later. So uh, what we have here is a, a, a narrative uh, invoking carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, fossil fuels, Kyoto Protocol, rising sea levels, deforestation, the greenhouse effect, melting ice caps, climate models, the IPCC, science journals, the Amazon, and many other entities uh, assembled together uh, in a narrative to uh, attributing climate change to the human action, so as the mainstream science position. So, and the, the, the existence of uh, a controversy concerning the causes was acknowledged, but later on in the article in small paragraphs uh, right in the in the middle and in the end of, of of the article but even though it was acknowledged it was mentioned that uh, it was a minority point of view and this was reflected in most of uh, our the, the, the articles that we studied and uh, if if we think of references in terms of allies brought to support different points of view uh, we have the, a panorama of, 
of those of those elements invoked to support this this mainstream narrative that we found in, in the articles. So uh, the the most uh, mentioned. Uh, reference was the, the IPCC fourth assessment report, which if we, if we think of it in terms of uh, the AMT methodology, we can say that the IPCC assessment report has become an obligatory point of passage for uh, these articles, which we could translate as, uh, you can't talk of climate change without mentioning the IPCC assessment report. You cannot talk about that without passing through it. And this is what we found in, in our articles. But and we also found that uh, in this environment in which the mainstream uh, narrative prevails, uh, it, it took a lot of references to support controversial points of view. So whenever the solar activity cycle was mentioned as a possible cause for global warming, it was backed by several references so that it could not be deleted by other users. So even though uh, the, the mainstream position was prevalent, uh, whenever uh, natural causes were invoked, they needed to, have str to, to be strongly supported, uh, otherwise they would be deleted. And uh, from now on, I, uh, we will highlight some episodes that are representative of how the, this controversy was, was being performed. And uh, you, can, you have a much more detailed discussion of these examples and other examples in the paper that you can download from the, the conference site. But uh, I will try to discuss some of them here. So in this case, in the Kyoto Protocol article, we had uh, a, a very powerful ally was invoked to, um, to, uh, to support the, the the, the, the natural causes position. Uh, it, it was mentioned that the White House also questions the scientific consensus that the pollutants emitted by humans cause the rise of Earth temperature. So this, uh, this statement resisted for a few years, but it was eventually replaced by uh, a user who changed the White House by some Americans. And this is the version that is still uh, prevailing today. So another case, there was no room for climate gate. I, I, I'm not sure if you've heard of the climate gate. It's uh, uh, some leaked emails by, by, uh, by science, British science, climate scientists who were used by critics as a, 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 a alleged proof that they were frauding the, the public opinion. They were trying to build uh, manufactured data to, to support their their position. So uh, this is the talk page of the global warming article. At, at a given point, uh, one user has suggested that uh, given the scandal that portrays anthropogenic global warming as the greatest farce of the millennium, I propose that this page is modified in order to host the abundance of new information concerning the IPCC, the peer review process, and much more. It was under the climate gate section. And uh, soon after that, uh, an administrator intervened and said, well, I, I advise you to read the, the, the answer of several scientists in those pages, and he gave three references. And the climate gate uh, scandal never reached the, the, the article pages. And uh, it, it, they also tried to uh, mention it again, and it was not admitted in the, in the main article pages. So it, it's not mentioned. So readers of uh, uh, Portuguese Wikipedia don't know that this case happened. So th there was no room for the climate gate in Portuguese Wikipedia. Challenges to the IPCC were not tolerated. So uh, at a point, at the end of the introduction of the global warming uh, article, uh, a user, uh, uh, which mentioned the IPCC in the end, a, uh, a user said that the reliability of this organ is disputed. And this intervention lasted less than one hour. And only hegemonic texts are accepted as valid sources. In so uh, at a given point in the global warming article, a graph was included by an IP identified user claiming that there was no correlation between greenhouse gases emissions and the rising temperatures. It was removed one hour later by a former administrator who claimed, please cite Re reliable sources. A blog is not accepted as a source. 
So uh, only hegemonic texts, science texts, were accepted. And claims disputing anthropogenic global warming removed even from the talk pages. This is a, uh, was a quite surprising result for me. Even uh, in several attempts uh, to, to say that global warming was a farce, global warming was a fallacy, in the top page of the global warming articles, every time it was, uh, it was tried, it, they, it was deleted from uh, here. They said, this is a farce, global warming is a farce, and it was deleted a few hours later. Several different users tried to insert uh, similar uh, statements in the talk page, and they were systematically deleted, even from the talk pages. So this was uh, a very curious finding, in my opinion. And uh, so as a conclusion, uh, we, we found that uh, Wikipedia uh, somehow backs the prevailing proposition, and it seems to follow closely the hegemonic uh, scientific point of view on climate change. And uh, the prevalence of, the, of this uh, mainstream point of view uh, reflects, but also, as we say, consubstantiates the strength of those propositions. If you type aquecimento global, which is global warming in Portuguese, if you type it on Google, the first result you get is from Wikipedia. So Wikipedia somehow adds its force to the, the, the several other elements who uh, uh, are involved in this huge social technical network uh, uh, backing the human-made uh, climate change. So in, in terms of ANT, once again, we could say that human-made climate change is rendered more accurate as it has its circulatory system thickened by Wikipedia. And, uh, in a way, we could say as well that admins, bots, IPs, uh, Wikipedia's rules and principles are all uh, joining their forces to the network supporting human-made climate change. And uh, these articles reinforce the network of allies supporting the anthropogenic account of climate change. And uh, as uh, to use another ANT uh, expression, the collaborative encyclop encyclopedia becomes one of the spokespersons of the mainstream science. So this is what we have to say. These are our sponsors. We thank them very much for helping us being here. And we thank you all for listening to us. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, if you take a look at the um, the, the page on verifiability and uh, reliable sources. Um, for me, your results do not really come as a surprise, given that, of course, as reliable sources, the first uh, most desirable reliable source mentioned is a peer-reviewed um, publication. So, um, and um, of course, we, we know that uh, scientists are not free from attitudes and personal beliefs and stuff like that. But um, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, assuming they would be, um, how, uh, how would, uh, I, I kind of um, hear from your talk um, that um, <coughs> some kind of conflict and that, um, um, that only this one position is, uh, is, is favored, um, as you said. But if, if there would be a consensus in science that it is some kind of fact, and like 98% of scientists believe that way, um, how can we decide, I mean, how could, is there some way to decide between, okay, scientists are biased, or this rather reflects um, maybe what comes most closest to objectivity, as like Popper put it, um, that the best ideas just survive? I mean, because there's also something like the Flat Earth Society, and I don't know whether I want to have um, their arguments on the planet Earth in the Wikipedia article, because I just would not really believe them. So is there some way where you could Distinguish between those cases? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, let me try to answer you. That there is a, a kind of point of view here that uh, was not shown on the presentation, but it's the, this issue of wisdom of the crowds. So uh, uh, we don't have wisdom of the crowds properly, because wisdom of the crowds for traditional science, for the hegemonic science, is belief, it's not knowledge. So uh, what, we, what we see is that uh, Wikipedia works as a spokesperson for science, for, as Benjamin 
the doctors yesterday. It's a very known product. It's an encyclopedia. So uh, it's a spokesperson for spokesperson. Uh, if we take the uh, scientists as spokespersons of nature, then Wikipedia is spokespersons of those spokes so spokespersons. Meet the spokespersons in a way. Yeah. So so this is this is a kind of, of so there is so the, the the controversy that is reflected in Wikipedia is the controversy that is reflected in the scientific community. And there is that there are voices that are uh, talking about the uh, natural uh, sources for, for global warming. There is literature about it, and it isn't in, in, in the article. You can, you can look at it. It's not a kind of secret club that it's dreaming about uh, an, an hypothesis that was is not uh, advocated by, by some scientists or by some researchers. It's not the case. The second point here is what relates our, our research with your research. It's, uh, I would wish to say that it's a kind of netnography because all, all these statistics and numbers they, 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 they produce an, as an effect a kind of panorama where you see everything but at the same time you see nothing at all. It's like watching a city from an aerial view. So you see the city but you don't see nothing. So where is, uh, uh, where is we keep to, uh, if, we, if we keep on the line of, of Latour, where is Wikipedia in action? One of the main sources is the, the, are the top pages. So we, we, we use this kind of ethnography because numbers by themselves, they, they, they are uh, uh, very difficult to treat. When we get to the discussion, the real discussion of what's happening, so we can figure out what's what's happening together with the numbers, not not only the numbers, but together with them. Not not to say that the, the statistical works uh, are not useful. We have a joke in Portuguese that says statistics is the art of torturing the numbers until they confess what you want. They, they <laughs> confess. That that doesn't mean that I am diminishing the the, the role of numbers, but. Uh, I'm privileging the, the, the choices about the world we want to live in. And so that, that's what you have to do with the numbers, to point in the direction of your propositions. That, that's the point here. I don't know if I answered. Yeah, right. So we have time for one more question. We can, of course, continue the discussion after the session anyway. Um, very first short, very short one. Um, when the message was deleted from the talk page, could you just translate the comment that the, uh, the, the deletion did? And then the second one, after, because this is really short. No, I see. Actually, I can't read it. I think it's on the paper, but uh, what was mentioned is uh, there is a, a policy in, in Portuguese Wikipedia, which I didn't find an exact equivalent in, uh, in other versions of Wikipedia, which says Wikipedia is not a forum. I mean, uh, so they, they said that talk pages are not meant to, to discuss the issue of, of the, the, the article. It's, it's meant to discuss the the ways the article is being built. So uh, this was an opinion about climate change. It was not an opinion about the article. That was the, the uh, I, I'll, I'll try to find it in the article and, 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 no, actually, and tell you later. Actually, exists on English Wikipedia as well, and mm -hmm. many of the other Yes. Um, second question I had, what I didn't get, is there at least a section of the article that says something like criticism on, on the, <coughs> on the theory that humans are fault-advocates? Yes, there is, but it's very short. I is there a link to a longer article on that or not? Uh, a very short article. It's, re it's related, it's linked to another article which was included in our sample, but because of the time of the presentation, we couldn't mention every, but it's discussed in more details in the, in the, in the article. But yeah. basically, it is actually, um, it would, the, the criticism was mostly outsourced because it's regarded as a French point of view on the on Yes, the yes, I would say so. Okay. 
the, the translation? Yeah. Well, yeah. You can read the cross of the mind. Uh, yes, no, uh, in, in fact, I think you wanted the, the, the text itself. The guy said, uh, I can find it here. He, the, so the intervention that, that was deleted said, the manipulations of scientists about global warming. Um, this was the, the, the name of the session. It's a, it's a quotation from the position. Yes, I, uh, I don't have it in full here, but we, we had several different uh, paragraphs claiming that it was a, a hoax, a fallacy, uh, this kind of things, and it was systematically removed. I mean, we have at least seven or eight occurrences, such occurrences. Okay, so. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're out of time, and so we can continue the discussion. Um, and thank you all. Later on. So thank you very much. Thank you.